First off, focusing on early environment, environmental factors having something to do with adult sexual behavior. What we can translate that into is ways in which early environment affects every single one of these subsequent ones. What does early environment childhood have to do with shaping of sexual behavior? A theme that's also going to come out in every topic we're going to hear of after this, buzzwords that should be beginning to be keeping you awake at night, modulatory, contingent, if then, all that stuff. Here's another one, here's another concept that comes through. The evidence shows that there is very little about early life experience which influences the quality, the way in which an organism goes about having sex. What's another way of stating it? This is a pretty set in stone bunch of fixed action patterns. Early experience is not about learning how to be sexual. Early experience is about learning the appropriate social contexts for being so. And that is shown in species after species. That is what experience is about. Not how to do it, but when to do it, and who you should not in your right mind try to do something proceptive to, and things of that sort. This is what early experience is about. And what we're going to see in a week is the exact same boring paragraph. Early experience does not teach organisms how to be aggressive. It teaches organisms the appropriate context for being aggressive. So what's the sort of evidence for this, for these early effects? One example, a whole literature that emerged that is covered somewhat in the Zebra book in another domain, but this whole literature that emerged in the 1950s, work looking at captive primates, what are the consequences of growing up in a certain degree of social isolation? What happens to behavior? And eventually, people studying behavior and physiology, what happens to behavior in adulthood if you are a young rhesus monkey who grows up only with peers and no mother? Or grows up only with a mother and no peers? Or grows up with mother being present only intermittently? Or at the most extremes, growing up with neither mother nor peers or any other member of your species around, you will see in the book a whole discussion of the ethics of these studies. But what does your early social environment have to do with things like sexual behavior? And what you see coming out the end is when you looked at these adult primates, since replicated over and over, they go about the sexual behavior the plain old way that everybody else does, but they do it in totally socially inappropriate context. And thus you have these males who were raised in some degree of isolation early on, growing up and carrying out perfectly normal sexual fixed action patterns on the towel in the room, on the bowl of food, on the who knows what wrong context. You have trying to do things with animals you should not go anywhere near in terms of social dominance and such, inappropriate context. Early experience shaping not how, but when, what the if-then clauses are. More issues of early experience shaping adult sexual behavior, arousal, proceptivity, etc. We already heard one example of this with humans. That's the whole kibbutz literature. That was that whole business that if you spend lots of intimate time with somebody before age six, what you will do is in some subliminal imprinting way decide forever after this individual does not feel like a potential mate this individual feels like a sibling. That was the example in the recognizing a relative lecture of showing that, hooray, we are such a cognitively sophisticated species. We can figure out who somebody's fourth cousin three steps removed is by thinking, and that's how we make our mating decisions, showing instead in those studies there is this non-conscious level. One of the rules that humans have is lots of exposure intimately to somebody early on in life, and you you are not going to be very likely to get that proceptive behavior stuff going on later, part of turning them into a pseudo kin because of that early exposure. One additional domain I will touch on here in terms of early experience, which is what does early experience have to do with sexual orientation? And depending on which decade you are asking this question, the answer would range from everything to virtually nothing. 
going back to the virtually everything time, which was dominating sort of the first half of the 20th century, how people thought about the subject, what you had were two broad models for what sort of early environments increased the likelihood of boys becoming gay as adults. And these were the two models. The first one was the absence of a father figure model. And this was one straight out of monkeys learning who they should try to pelvic thrust with or some such thing. This was the argument that what do father figures provide appropriate training for appropriate contexts for proceptive sexual behavior growing up absent a father, father figure, increasing the likelihood of being gay. <clears throat> The other model was having this totally pain in the neck, neurotic, screwed up mother who, as basically said between the lines, makes you crazy when you grow up and thus you have circa 1950 psychiatrically certifiable disorder of having a different sexual orientation. Obviously, where I'm going to head right now is there has not been a slightest shred of evidence over the years either for the missing father figure model of sexual orientation or the neurotic mothering style model. Complete nonsense. 